We love Baha'u'llah because he has united us. Today we eat together, we work together, and this is thanks to him. We understand so many new things because of Baha'u'llah. He taught us the love of God and to have love and unity among ourselves. That is why now we eat and share together. God has blessed us. Everything that we do right now is very much connected to the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Whenever we have a gathering, it, when, we, when we come together, when we say prayers, it's like having this, this, this very beautiful community where everyone knows each other and we're very connected. Blessed is the smart and the house and the place and the city and the heart. I know more about my neighbors. I know more the children that live here, the youth that live here. And it all comes down to the teaching and the revelation of Paula. It's, it's, yes, my family grew, it doubled and tripled a bit. The word Baha'u'llah has given us is the meaning of being indigenous. And being that, we have an obligation to contribute to the rest of the world from what God has given us. The last prophets or messengers from God that we have had in our midst, they have talked about winter and springtime. And Baha'u'llah is the springtime. There is a story unfolding. A story of humanity's progress through history. Propelled by the teachings of messengers of God. Messengers guiding humanity through its stages of development. And now to the dawn of its maturity. The messengers of God are like teachers for humanity, bringing particular messages. Their messages are adapted to the capacity of humanity at the time that they appear. Now is the time of Baha'u'llah, the messenger of God for this day. Baha'u'llah his uh, purpose is to unite all mankind, to bring all races, classes, peoples, different backgrounds to be united. The teachings of Baha'u'llah are inspiring millions of people, transforming neighborhoods, villages, and cities in every country on earth. Baha'u'llah Baha'u'llah has come to transform the whole character of humanity, to bring about an internal and external change in the conditions of the world. Baha'u'llah's teachings are vast in scope, essential in nature. Their central feature is the oneness of humankind, with all its implications for the transformation of those essential relationships that bind peoples and nations, helping them to transcend all forms of prejudice, to advance the equality of women and men, to uplift the downtrodden, and to foster economic justice. These teachings of Baha'u'llah represent an end to division and otherness. This is the time for the recognition that all people are one family, for the building of a united world 
that embraces the diversity of its peoples. It is a new chapter of humanity's story, a chapter that began 200 years ago. Persia, 1817. The world is asleep. It is the hour of dawn on an ordinary day when an extraordinary child is born to humanity. He will come to be known as Baha'u'llah. As a child, Baha'u'llah lives a princely life. His father is a distinguished government minister, and his ancestry goes back to the greatest dynasties of Persia. Baha'u'llah was a wondrous child. He was intellectually very gifted. His attitude and his bearing surprised everyone who met him. Adults would ask each other about Baha'u'llah. How is it that this young child has a manner and a level of understanding greater than our own? His responses were so profound. They were surprised that he never attended school. His intelligence and spirituality surpassed everyone. As Baha'u'llah grows to young adulthood, he turns his back on a life of luxury and prominence and instead dedicates himself to helping the poor and the oppressed. Baha'u'llah, at the age of 22, should have replaced his father in his role as government minister, as was the custom at the time. Baha'u'llah refused the rank of minister, preferring to remain a private citizen. Day after day, there were people in need. He helped the poor. Morning to night, there were always visitors coming by. This is why he gained the name, the father of the poor. He loved everyone equally, giving his life for all. Giving up oneself is not an easy thing. A person who sacrifices for others is special, someone who has great capacity for love. Baha'u'llah's dedication to serving those in need stands in stark contrast with the attitudes among the nobility of the time. Later in life, he would demonstrate the temporary nature of the material world and all its riches by relating a story from his childhood. He describes watching an elaborate puppet show while still a young child during the wedding celebration of his older brother. Very quickly, little characters started moving around, and the little characters announced, His Majesty is coming, prepare the seats. Finally, a royal character arrives, who was very majestic, very haughty, and who had a very shiny crown. Gunshots were fired, trumpets blasted, and all of a sudden the tent was full of smoke. The play ended, and 20 minutes later, a man comes out from the back of the tent with a little box in his arms. Baha'u'llah stopped him and said, What is in this box? He said to him, Everything you saw, the princes, the king, the ministers, everything you have seen is now locked away in this box. Baha'u'llah tells this story to help explain the true purpose of our physical existence. Ere long, these outward trappings, these visible treasures, these earthly vanities, these proud and overweening souls, all shall pass into the confines of the grave, as though into that box. It behooveth therefore every man of insight to fix his gaze upon the goal of eternity. 
Baha'u'llah explains through this story that the reality of this life is fleeting. None of it lasts. Really, the nature of human beings is that, yes, we have a material self that lives in this world and passes away, but we also have a soul that comes from God and is eternal and will continue to last long after the physical body dies. Baha'u'llah teaches us that God gave each one of us a soul, qualities and attributes like compassion, justice, and forgiveness, creating us essentially as noble beings. And each one of us has the capacity to reflect those qualities that come from God. Baha'u'llah says, Noble have I created thee, yet thou hast abased thyself. Rise then unto that for which thou wast created. Man was created to contribute to the betterment of society, to advance civilization. And one of the ways that he does that is with the knowledge that he is a noble soul, he is a noble being. When we understand that the soul was created in the image of God, each time we see someone, the most important thing to look for is not their skin color, nor their gender. No. It is their soul. It is through the soul that we will understand one another to know that we are one. Baha'u'llah has said, we created you all from the same dust so that we would not prefer ourselves over others. If every man and woman were to understand this concept, the people of the world would become united and equality between men and women would be realized. Baha'u'llah brought us laws and principles to change, to transform society. Before, it was thought that women couldn't make decisions, couldn't study. But today, thanks to the revelation of Baha'u'llah, we have now learned that as women, we play such an important role of participating in the community. Men and women are like the two wings of a bird, which means that humanity cannot progress without both wings of this bird. So Baha'u'llah made the equality between men and women a vital prerequisite for progress in this age. It must be accepted. Baha'u'llah brought principles to unite humanity, humanity with its different cultures, tribes, races and customs, requires principles that can unite all. Baha'u'llah's reputation for kindness and compassion, for insight and wisdom, becomes widespread in his native land. At the same time, a sudden and galvanizing movement begins to spread throughout all of Persia. A young man, known as the Bab, or the Gate, had arisen to awaken humanity and prepare the world for the long-awaited promised one of all ages. Baha'u'llah becomes a prominent supporter of his cause. But the Bab's teachings are met with opposition from those in power. The clergy and the government denounce him and relentlessly persecute his followers. Thousands are murdered. Eighteen fifty, a military square in Tabriz. The Bob himself is executed under dramatic circumstances.
Após a execução do Bob, After the execution of the Bob, his followers continued to be persecuted and thousands were massacred. Baha'u'llah was faced with a false charge and a warrant was issued for his arrest. He was arrested. He was chained, he was beaten, he was made to walk barefooted, and then he was put into a dungeon called Siyah Chal, literally means the black pit. The place was dark, there was no light, there was one entrance. It was full of filth and unbelievable. I mean, we cannot really get our heads around what that place was like. Bahola had a heavy chain around his neck. The marks the chain left was evident all his life. Well, you look at that tragedy, you look at that, and your heart breaks. People wait for many, many years for the beloved to appear, and then they do this to him. But he was in the same Siachong that Baha'u'llah received inspiration from God, that he is the manifestation of God for today. During the days I lay in the prison of Tehran, though the galling weight of the chains and the stench-filled air allowed me but little sleep, still, in those infrequent moments of slumber, I felt as if something flowed from the crown of my head over my breast, even as a mighty torrent that precipitateth itself upon the earth from the summit of a lofty mountain. And he said his, his voice uttered verses that no one could bear at that moment. So there, in that most awful of situations, that moment of light, that moment when the radiance, when the light became manifested in him, it's just a contrast, it's just practically impossible to imagine. This is the beginnings of you know, many things to come, and we can see that that's had an effect the revelation of God has an effect on the whole world, you know, from that point. Baha'u'llah endures four months of intense suffering in the black pit. Orders are given that he, along with his family, be banished forever from his homeland. Sick and frail, he crosses the Zagros Mountains in the bitter cold of winter to reach Baghdad. This begins a period of exile that will last the remaining 40 years of his life. For the time being, the truth of his divine mission is kept hidden. A year passes. Baha'u'llah takes to the wilderness, departing for solitude to the mountains in the region of Kurdistan. There, he immerses himself in meditation and prayer for two years. At length, Abandoning my home and all that was therein, 
and renouncing my life and all that pertained thereunto, I retired alone and companionless. I roamed the wilderness of resignation. The birds of the air were my companions, and the beasts of the field my associates. The period is reminiscent of the meditation of Buddha at Bodhgaya, the forty days and nights that Jesus spent in the desert, and the retreat of Muhammad to the mountain of Nur. In time, the people in the area become aware of the presence of Baha'u'llah, and stories of his greatness spread throughout the region. When he came to us, to those mountains, valleys and caves, he spent the most serene two years of his life. Behold the contrast of the situation. He lived a very rough and difficult life, yet his only two peaceful years were here. Generation after generation, this memory is still alive in the minds of the people. To this day, people still talk about it. When he returns to Baghdad, it's a time of great joy and celebration for the community. And of course, the personality of Baha'u'llah attracted everyone. Those who heard of him came and wanted to converse with him, and many turned to Baha'u'llah for advice. When Baha'u'llah was living in Baghdad, many people came to see him, and he used to welcome them all with great love. Baha'u'llah taught and spoke about a good character and about integrity, faithfulness, trustworthiness, truthfulness, and about unity and a moral code, counseling against retaliation in favor of peace, equality, and fellowship. This is the message that he brought. The life-giving words of Baha'u'llah's revelation flow with miraculous speed and force from his pen. In the course of his life, his writings would make up more than 100 volumes, writings that have now been translated into over 800 languages. During his time in Baghdad, he writes, Is not the object of every revelation to effect a transformation in the whole character of mankind? A transformation that shall manifest itself both outwardly and inwardly? That shall affect both its inner life and external conditions? God sends messengers or great teachers to us. And each of those teachers have come with a revealed word from God. And the word of God then for today is the revelation of Baha'u'llah. The word of God has the potency, the power to change the human soul. But humanity has to learn to use it. So then it's not just for me, it's not for my personal transformation, it's for the transformation of my community. The more we learn to understand the Word of God, the more we learn to raise our own capacity to be able to make effort to contribute to the betterment of humanity. That's where the Word of God comes alive when it's expressed in service and worship. The revelation of Baha'u'llah can't be expressed in words. One doesn't even know how to describe it. First of all, it transforms you. Then you educate your children and raise them under the effects of its teachings. The relationships in the family change for the good. Then you develop your understanding of service and you want to pass it on to society.
You see, I love the teachings of Baha'u'llah, where they say that we are like a garden of flowers that has different colors of flowers, different designs, and so on. So we understand that we are one. And as we understand that we are one, then we have to work for that oneness. So in the process of working for that oneness, we serve others, we help others. And it's so easy these days to get caught up in kind of focusing on your own uh, troubles, your own desires, and to live a life around that. Bahalo encourages us to turn away from ourselves and actually to think about others. You notice that actually happiness, it doesn't arrive when you're kind of fulfilling your own desires, but actually when you're um, assisting someone else or helping them to accomplish something that they couldn't. And that's been a real kind of shift in mentality for me. Being able to provide service to the community and encourage others to do so. There is one quotation from Baha'u'llah that I love so much in which he says, the betterment of the world can be accomplished through pure and goodly deeds, through commendable and seemly conduct. This makes me think, what good deed can I accomplish in my daily life? What is the deed that will please God that I can apply in my life and in the life of society? Our purpose in life right now is um, in service. We still have racism around, black against whites, you know, but even different nationalities. But then, you know, we all come together and we have this bond. And that is like to bring unity into this community and um, to the world. The words of Baha'u'llah enhance the understanding of individuals and enable the people in the community to uplift themselves and to work together. The good thing that I see in my community is that when people show love and unity and interact with each other, they share their diverse knowledge and learn from one another. God gave knowledge to everyone, and not just for the benefit of a few. Empowerment is having knowledge, knowledge of who I am, of what is around me, of the purpose that God has for humanity. Once we understand this, then we look for ways to help others, to acquire this knowledge and to contribute to transformation according to their capacities. Baha'u'llah came to teach the poor, to cure them, to heal them, and to help the weak. Baha'u'llah came to do this. The time of change has come. The old ways of doing things is gone. When that cyclone hit us, many of us almost lost hope. The revelation of Baha'u'llah helped us greatly to adopt the spirit of resilience. When Baha'u'llah brought his revelation to China, the, the impact that it did on this island was tremendous. The power of the force of the cyclone was not able to overcome the spiritual force that was in the people. Instead of the people losing hope, they didn't. They rose up. 
that is a physical evidence of something in them. They have the revelation of God's power in them, moving them to do things. They don't lose hope. The influence of Baha'u'llah and his teachings continues to infuriate the Persian authorities. At their urging, the Ottoman Sultan exiles him farther still from his native land. Before departing Baghdad, Baha'u'llah gathers his companions for 12 days in a garden called Rizvan on the Tigris River. It is here, with his tent pitched along the rose-lined pathways, that Baha'u'llah proclaims publicly for the first time that he is the promised messenger of God for this day. In this moment, a new era in human history begins. Everything would change. The magnitude of the transformation called for by Baha'u'llah is hinted at in some of the words he speaks regarding these days. That which was hidden is now revealed, and that which was concealed is now come. Bestir yourselves to greet this day a day whereon the gates of heaven have been flung open and the clouds of eternity have rained down. His words release a tidal wave of spiritual energy whose effects will extend across countless generations into the future. Baha'u'llah, along with his family and companions, is exiled deep into the Ottoman Empire. First to Istanbul, then Edirne. The authorities hope to eradicate his faith once and for all, but Baha'u'llah's influence proves unstoppable. Years pass. In 1868, he is banished yet again, this time to a harsh and remote colony on the outskirts of the Ottoman Empire, the prison city of Akka. The arrival of Baha'u'llah in Akka is difficult to describe. The heat, the lack of wind, from the sea gate of the prison city, they were taken through these dark, narrow streets. Baha'u'llah and his family were taken to the prison, a run-down building in a miserable condition. They asked the prison guards for a drink of water, but the guards refused to give them any food or water. In the end, they reluctantly gave them something, but the water was undrinkable. During those days, because of these conditions, three among the friends passed away. Baha'u'llah has written about his sufferings in his holy writings that he was willing to carry the weight of heavy chains so that we may be released from bondage and consented to be a prisoner in a mighty fortress in order to free humanity. And he drank to its dregs the cup of sorrow so that we may live in joy and happiness. 
we have accepted to be abased, O believers in the unity of God, that ye may be exalted and have suffered manifold afflictions, that ye might prosper and flourish. It is during his exile and imprisonment that Baha'u'llah writes letters to the monarchs and rulers of the time, openly proclaiming his station as the messenger of God for this day. Baha'u'llah wrote these letters to the kings and rulers of the world during an age of empires. This is a period of time where a few rulers governed most of the world. Baha'u'llah calls these rulers to something very important. It is a call for peace and to ensure that the powerful of the world do not oppress their people. How remarkable that this prisoner, under such appalling conditions, would write to the rulers and the kings of that time to offer guidance on how to lead their people with compassion and justice. The message he gave them was that a ruler should listen to their people, they should govern in the interests of the poor, and they should consult in all of their affairs. The principle of consultation is a way of making decisions in a manner that allows individuals to be focused on the pursuit of truth and the good of the whole. Through consultation, groups of people can share and express their ideas freely. Then, collectively, with the power of the unity of the group, through consultation, we can make collective decisions. The fact that we are able to build unity concretely is an immense gift that Baha'u'llah has given us. Baha'u'llah did something extraordinary. It is very rare to see people who have not even been to school together with people who have gone to university and for those people to be able to discuss matters together in order to find a common point of view. Consultation can serve as a means for giving voice to the masses. Baha'u'llah teaches it's for everyone. All of us were absolutely encouraged to participate in this process. and. It's also closely related to attaining justice on our planet in that all groups have the right and the privilege and the duty to participate in a consultative process. We live in a time when it's becoming increasingly difficult to hide how many people in the world are suffering, like how many injustices, how many challenges humanity is facing. We don't just want to get rid of injustice, we actually want to build justice. When we come together with others to find strategies, solutions, ways to address many of the complex challenges that we face in society, we have to do so in a, in a way that builds unity, in a way that strengthens collaboration, that uh, builds consensus. Baha'u'llah teaches that the faculty of justice, the faculty of our soul that allows us to distinguish truth from error, allows us to be fair-minded, to treat others in equitable ways, is essential to that process. In fact, justice is the greatest instrument for the establishment of unity. One now has a wider vision of what unity means. And with the different cultures, languages, ethnicities, we are one because we are all children of the same God. The world is in great turmoil, and the minds of its people are in a state of utter confusion. We entreat the Almighty that he may graciously illuminate them with the glory of his justice and enable them to discover that which will be profitable unto them at all times and under all conditions.
Baha'u'llah spends nine years confined behind the walls of the prison city of Akka. Over time, the leaders of the city grow to love and admire him. They eventually ignore the Sultan's order and request, even beg, Baha'u'llah to leave the confines of the city. Finally, he moves to a place outside the city gates, called Bachi. The last 12 years of his life, Baha'u'llah lived in Bahji. Many prominent people visited him there. One of them was Edward Granville Brown, a professor at Cambridge University, who wrote an account of his first meeting and the deep impression it left on him. I found myself in a large apartment. A second or two elapsed ere, with a throb of wonder and awe, I became definitely conscious that the room was not untenanted. In the corner, where the divan met the wall, sat a wondrous and venerable figure. Those piercing eyes seem to read one's very soul. No need to ask in whose presence I stood, as I bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love which kings might envy, and emperors sigh for in vain. A mild, dignified voice bade me be seated, and then continued. Thou hast come to see a prisoner and an exile. We desire but the good of the world and happiness of the nations, that all nations should become one in faith and all men as brothers, that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened, that differences of race be annulled. What harm is there in this? Yet so it shall be. These fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away, and the most great peace shall come. May 1892. After 40 years of suffering and exile on behalf of humanity, Baha'u'llah passes away here, in Bachi. His resting place, now restored and beautified, is the spiritual heart and a place of pilgrimage for millions of people around the world. People striving daily in their home communities to put Baha'u'llah's teachings of unity, justice, and equality into practice. The change called for by Baha'u'llah is of amazing magnitude. He's not just calling for cooperation in social structures and in interpersonal relationships, but he's calling for a reconceptualization, a rethinking of relationships such that they embody the principle of the oneness of mankind. And it's going to require collaboration with others, interaction with others, and learning from experience, and then weighing things against this magnificent, huge vision. The vision of Baha'u'llah is that unity will come to the world. 
So certainly, unity will come to the village. Some people, including myself, felt that it was not possible to unite everyone together because people have different opinions. But now we are certain that Baha'u'llah's vision will become a reality. The influence of his revelation is now visible in our community. When elders, youth, and everyone discuss together, unity of thought is visible. Through the coming of Baha'u'llah, the spiritual potential of each person is revealed. If we follow the teachings of Baha'u'llah, his revelation, we will already be in paradise in our own homes. I come from a community in Panama, an indigenous community, a community that was completely burdened with illiteracy. But when the revelation of Baha'u'llah arrived there, it affected the thinking and the culture. It generated a change and a transformation from within the people. Baha'u'llah talks about the role of education, of a family, of a people, of a race. And for the first time, the friends understood that education was a powerful beacon for their liberation. If the revelation of Baha'u'llah has been like a powerful light that has been able to transform a community like ours, isn't it possible that it could transform any community, anywhere in the world. The mission of Baha'u'llah in this day has a different scope from in the past, in the sense that we are talking about establishing a new civilization, basically a spiritualized world civilization. We are trying to learn how to build different kinds of communities, really create a different culture that reflects the teachings of Baha'u'llah. One dedicated to service, to collaborating with others in great endeavors, in unity, working with peoples of all backgrounds. That is the conception of religion that we find in Baha'u'llah's revelation, one that is leading us toward the next stage in humanity's evolution, which is the unification of the human race. <laughs> there is a story unfolding. It is the story of humanity's encounter with God. An encounter playing out around the world, in villages and neighborhoods, towns and cities, in which every soul is a vital participant. It is an encounter full of promise and illumined by the words of Baha'u'llah. Blessed is he who prefereth his brother before himself. In the garden of thy heart, plant not but the rose of love. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. The earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. So powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. The aim of this wronged one in sustaining woes and tribulations, in revealing the holy verses, and in demonstrating proofs, has been naught but to quench the flame of hate and enmity, that the horizon of the hearts of men may be illumined with the light of concord, and attain real peace and tranquility.